right, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, there's a lot to cover this morning, so we're just going to dive right in. I'm not going to dilly-dally too much. I'd say I'm worried about fitting it all in, but that would be deeply ironic for reasons that will become apparent quickly. So let's go to the text here. Matthew 6, verse 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now this passage begins with a word. Therefore, and whenever we see the word therefore in Scripture, we should ask a question. What is it there for? <laughs> it's a connecting word. It connects ideas to one another. It's raining outside, therefore I'm going to bring my umbrella. I'm hungry, therefore I'm going to eat. Pepe is a master at destroying things, therefore new toys in our house last about 20 minutes. The ideas are connected. Because of this, that happens. And so Jesus begins with a therefore, which means everything he's saying here is going to be connected to what he said previously, to the verse before it. And this was the last verse of the passage we went over last week in verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so everything he's saying about worry here is rooted in serving God over serving money. That when we're serving God, we're free from worry. When we're not a slave to worry, that's what that word meant back then, it meant to be a slave to. When we're not a slave to money, we're free from worrying about it. And it's not just that these two ideas are connected, but Jesus has been running a thread through the entire Sermon on the Mount. Let's go, let's go all the way back. If you can remember back to, I guess this would have been May or something. <laughs> you go back to the Beatitudes, right? Hashtag blessed. We had little plants. What's the first Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor in spirit. The ones who admit, I can't do this on my own. The ones who can't make the grade. The ones who are holy, who can't be holy enough, who aren't righteous enough. Those are the ones that Jesus says, are blessed. Well, why does he say that? Well, because the ones he's blessed here, the ones he's chosen, they're the ones that own up to their own sin, that go, look, I'm poor here. I can't do this on my own. They know that, and they're looking to him for help. And so we're all in need of the gospel, and we receive it only when we own up to that and ask him for help. And so then he moves on to the commands, and we went through our series on that where he sort of takes, you've heard this, but I say this. You've heard this, but I say this. He's taking the law and he makes it even harder in some ways, right? He says, don't even, let's not stop it, don't murder. Let's go all the way to don't harbor resentment towards other people. Let's not stop at don't commit adultery. Don't even lust after someone else. It's not even about just the physical. He sort of raises the bar on all of these commands. He's showing us this incredibly high standard. And now make no bones about it, he's calling us to live this standard. They're commands, not illustrations. But he knows something about us that we're all going to fail to meet that standard. And so they all drive us back to blessed are the poor 
in spirit. The ones who keep the law, who do it reasonably well, their righteousness, it's not good enough. He says you need a righteousness that's even better than that. We start looking at those commands and we start to feel pretty poor in spirit. And so then we move on and he warns us about relying on our own righteousness, about making a show out of it. He warns us about following those commands just so that other people see us following those commands. He wants us to follow them to please the Father. Not to stack up our own righteousness because we're never going to stack it high enough to count. We're never going to be successful at that. But it turns this into a labor of love. We love Jesus and what He's done for us and this righteousness He's given us. And so because of that, we're going to follow these commands the best we can. These are not the things we do to be saved. We're already picked. We're already chosen. Remember verse, chapter 5, verse 2. We're already blessed just because we have faith in Jesus. But when you have real faith in Jesus, then it means you want to serve Him. And so then everything we do starts going through this filter. Who are we trying to get approval from? Who are we trying to impress? Are we serving God out of love for Him? Is it everything that we do, is it about adoring Jesus, like our new mission statement here? And so what we see then is that when we do this, we are free from trying to win approval from other people. We don't have to do it anymore. We already have it in Jesus. And so go back to our top secret series. So we don't have to give ostentatiously. We can give in secret because it's not for anyone else to see. It's just because we love God and we're trying to serve Him the best we can. It's for heavenly reward. Prayer becomes connecting with our Heavenly Father. It's not about putting on a show for anybody else. Fasting is about serving Him and wanting to connect with Him and create that intimacy. It's a call, all of it, to put our faith in Jesus. It's all about adoring Him. And so then, if that's true, let's rewind back to last week. If that's true, then what do we prize? What do we treasure? If we're committed to Jesus, we're going to treasure Him above everything else. Last week, we saw he warns us about money. He says it's dangerous. It wants to pull you away from the devotion to God that I'm calling you to. And so he reframes that same idea again. Who are you out there to impress? What, what do you want? Who are you choosing? And so it's the gospel that sort of gets strewn throughout this sermon. It gets pulled through. That we're in desperate need of a Savior, every single one of us. And Jesus calls us to put our faith in Him, and that when we put our trust in Him, we get His righteousness that is way better than we could do on our own. And it frees us from impressing others, it frees us from being self-reliant, it frees us to follow Him. And as we see here today, it frees us from worry. The things still matter, but they don't drive us anymore. We don't worry about them. And so what we can see here is that the Bible is not disjointed. It's not just a series of random thoughts. It's connected from paragraph to paragraph. It's developing ideas. And it's important that when we're reading our Bible that we're reading it that way, that we're reading it thought to thought as we go. We don't just take a sentence that we like and pluck it out of context and then make that everything for us. That's literally how cults get started, right? And so this passage here today is the continuation of this theme that's been going from the beginning. And so then we also see here is that the Bible argues. It makes a case for itself. Jesus doesn't just say, don't worry. Well, why not? Well, because I said so. All right, I guess that sounds it. It makes a case for it. He gives here well, first, he says three or four times, don't be anxious, don't be anxious, don't be anxious, don't be anxious. Brings it back over and over, and then he makes arguments for why. As a matter of fact, he gives seven of them that we'll go through. And so, all right, we're one word in. What time is it here? Maybe we should get some pizzas ordered in or something. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We'll move through this rather quickly. But so the first reason Jesus gives is that life is more important than stuff. In verse 25, he says, it's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Jesus says we shouldn't be anxious about stuff because there's more to life than just the bare essentials. Life is about people 
and moments and memories, and most importantly, it's about the gospel. And so these things are important. They deserve way more attention than anything else. It's reason one. Reason two. The second reason he gives is that God takes care of creation, so of course he's going to take care of us too. And he makes this argument in two different ways. First, he says in verse 26, Look at the birds of the air. They neither, neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Then you jump down to verse 28. He says, And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is here, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? He's saying, look, God takes care of the birds, takes care of the flowers. Of course he's going to take care of you. He makes the argument with birds first. Birds don't plant crops, but they have enough to eat. Now, it's noteworthy that he doesn't say that birds don't work, because if you ever watch birds, they are tireless. They're always working hard. They're running around, and they're trying to grab everything that they possibly can. But the point is the birds aren't in control of their situation. Like Birds aren't like, well, I'm going to need some seeds, so I guess I'm going to go plant some other seeds, and then we'll have some seed. We'll be good to go. They don't do that. They just look around. They search for whatever they can find. And then God makes sure that they find it. So this isn't a call to laziness. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus wants us to be carefree, not careless. All right? He wants us to be carefree, not careless. But it's also noteworthy here that Jesus thinks we're valuable, right? Because he's sort of making the rhetorical approach here is if this is true, then how much more is this true? It's like, look, God cares for the birds, and you're worth way more than birds. He cares for the grass, you're worth way more than grass. There's this immense value that Jesus sees in us. Jesus thinks the world of you. To him, you are incredibly valuable. Jesus also says, your father, not their father. Which is interesting. Because again, he's sort of reinforcing this relationship that we have with God. That we can come to him as the good father. A good father that's going to take care of us. That's watching out for us. Just as he does all of his other creations. So reason two. If he takes care of creation, of course he's going to take care of you. Reason three. See, I told you we'd get through these quickly. The third reason Jesus gives is that worry is unproductive. In verse 27, he says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? Like, worry doesn't do anything. You can worry all you want. You're not going to live longer. It's not going to happen. If anything, some of the health science that we have now says quite the opposite, actually. Ultimately, what worry is, is it's a stationary bike. You do a lot of pedaling, you spend a lot of energy, but you don't go anywhere. You're burning it, but there's no movement here. And so what Jesus is doing here with this reason, he's pointing out how nonsensical worry is. Like, why would you do this? It doesn't do any good. You can't even add an hour to your life by worrying. Why get caught up with this? Why do it? The fourth reason that Jesus gives is that the Gentiles worry. Don't be like the Gentiles. It says, for the Gentiles seek after all these things. And so he's pointing around the pagan culture around him and saying, look, all of these guys worry. Don't you do it too? Disciples are different. We're not slaves to the world. We're not slaves to money. So we don't have to follow their lead. We don't have to do what they do. They're worried because they have no good father to trust in, right? The Roman gods were capricious and arbitrary, that you never really knew what you had to do to appease them. We talked about that a little bit in the message on prayer, a couple, where I sort of mentioned this prayer from one of the Romans to one of their gods, where he's just rattling off names for this god, and then eventually gives up and just says, like, and take whatever name that you need. Like, he's just like, I can't think of anything else. Just pick one. Just do this for me, please. 
They have to worry because they don't have the they don't have a God who is a good father who's watching out for them. So of course they're worried. And so Jesus points out they're worrying because you don't have to do that. You don't have that problem. We don't serve a God who's out to get us. We serve a God who's looking out for us. And so this connects directly then to reason five. The fifth reason is that God already knows our need and he's going to meet it. We can trust that God has our best interest in mind and that he will meet our needs. And he says, and your heavenly father knows that you need them all here. Jesus had just said with prayer, go back to the message on prayer we talked about in the Top Secret series, that he's just said there that God already knows what you need before you ask. So you don't have to keep babbling on. He's got it. And here he says it again. Your father already knows what you need. He's aware. You're never going to tell him anything he doesn't already know. And so when we worry what we're doing here, we're telling God that we don't believe that that's true. Worry, in a sense, is practical atheism. That we're saying, yeah, I trust you, God, but then we're not acting like we trust him at all. If you gave me directions somewhere and I was like, cool, I trust you, and then immediately like, turned around and looked it up on my phone and followed that, you'd be like, what's that? Like, clearly, I don't trust you with directions. That's what that means, right? And so I think worry is a lot like that. We tell God, yeah, I trust you. And then we hang on to everything. We worry about everything. We get anxious over things we can't control. What we're doing is we're showing him, yeah, actually, I said I trusted you, but really, maybe not so much. And so the Romans, they're anxious because of their gods. Their modern anxieties are maybe a little bit different than that. But they're still there. There's still a lot of things that people are anxious about today. People are anxious about their health. They worry over every little thing and fixate on either their diets or their waistline or whatever it may be. They think that they're going to hold off aging somehow, but Father Time is undefeated, like it's not going to happen. <laughs> and so they get anxious about that. They get anxious about their health. People get anxious about safety, complete hysteria about safety in our country, especially about the safety of children. Everyone is terrified that their children are going to get abducted by strangers. When in a study, the number, of, the percentage of missing people for whom strangers were responsible, you know the percentage of that? It's one one hundredth of one percent. Your kids aren't going to get abducted by strangers. It's okay. The TSA at airports, that's another great example of security, safety, anxiety that does no good because the TSA does absolutely nothing to make us safer. Uh, <laughs> but America's anxiety about safety, I guess, necessitates that they be there. They don't make us safer. As a matter of fact, the Home Department of Homeland Security once tested TSA. They sent through a bunch of fake weapons and explosives, and TSA missed 95% of them. So. Awesome job, everyone. <laughs> There's all kinds of worry now, especially about politics. You listen to supporters of either man can main candidate, and it sounds like if the other side wins, the country's just going to be this Mad Max wasteland when it's all said and done. <laughs> <laughs> and the reality is, you know, everything's going to probably be mostly the same as it is every single time this happens. People worry about anything and everything. But here's what I know, is that no matter what happens, Jesus is still on the throne. No matter what happens, God is still in control. And so Jesus is telling us, don't be afraid with everybody else. They're afraid of everything. Why would you? Why would you be afraid? You know that you have this good Father that's looking out for you, that knows your needs, that's going to meet your needs. What is there to fear? What can anyone do to you? You're afraid, oh no, what if someone kills you? They've just made your life immeasurably better. <laughs> That's the worst thing someone can do to me is make my life awesome. We can trust this good Father that knows what we need before we even have to ask. For people who don't have that, who don't have a relationship with Jesus, I get it. I understand why you'd be afraid. 
there'd be some things to be afraid about. But for us, there's just no place. Shouldn't be fearful. We should trust God. The sixth reason that Jesus gives here is that as we pursue him, our needs will be met. In verse 32, it says, For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Oh, I guess that's the one I just read. This is the Verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Notice, this is seeking his righteousness, not our righteousness. He's not saying build your righteousness up so high and then you'll be good enough and then all sorts of good stuff's going to happen for you. That's not what he says. So seek his righteousness. When you do that, when you seek his righteousness, then you're going to have everything you need. Martin Luther gives a strategy for this. He says, believing in Christ and practicing and applying the gospel to which faith clings. This involves growing and being strengthened at heart through preaching, listening, reading, singing, meditating, and every other possible way. I feel like that's a pretty good, like, gets it all there. This guy knew some things. To put it another way and to sort of connect it with what we talked about last week, when our treasure is in heaven, we don't have to worry. There's nothing to worry about. So when our treasure is in heaven, the rest is taken care of. The seventh reason that Jesus gives here for why we don't have to worry is that We've got enough to worry about today. Why are we worrying about tomorrow? This is what he says in verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day for its own trouble. And what's interesting here is that this appears to be a quote that Jesus is referencing. Not from like the Old Testament, but just from the secular wisdom of the day. That the people around him had sort of figured out, hey, like, you can't do anything about tomorrow, so why be anxious about it? And so he sort of brings that in here, but he roots it in something new, because now it's not just, oh, this is just sort of inherently true. It's rooted in trusting God. If you can trust God, then how much more do you not need to worry about tomorrow, about what it will bring? If it's true for them, how much more for his disciples? This is another way sort of saying, don't worry about things you can't change. Because that's what worry does. It's all these what ifs. It runs over every scenario. It frets over the results. Like, well, what if this happens? And what if this happens? And Jesus is saying, hey, save tomorrow's worries for tomorrow. And you know what's funny about tomorrow? Tomorrow never comes, right? Because today is Sunday. And tomorrow is tomorrow. But then when we get to Monday, well, that's today. <laughs> tomorrow's always, it's always delaying them. Like, ah, eh, no, we'll deal with it later. Jesus saying, procrastinate your worry. It's like, yeah, I'll do it later. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. It never comes. It keeps getting put off and put off. It's always a day away. <laughs> and so Jesus is saying, don't fixate on your future. Don't get worked up about it. Trust that God's going to take care of you. If you've put your faith in him, then what is there to worry about? And so that's ultimately the message here this morning, is don't worry. And instead of worrying, trust God. See, when we put our trust in Jesus, it's about our salvation. But it's about so much more than that as well. It's about trusting Him in every facet of our lives and every piece of it. It's about trusting Him with our future, trusting Him with our relationships, trusting Him with our security. But there are times, though, and maybe you've been sitting there and thinking this the whole message, well what, then, well, what happens then when it doesn't look like my needs are being met, when it looks like things are slipping, when things aren't going so well? What does, what does this have to say to that? Because there are times when we'll go through things that we'd rather not. Our health fails. There are times our finances collapse. Here's what I know, is that God uses everything for our good. That doesn't mean that we won't go through hard things. Quite the opposite. But that He's still in control and He's going to use them for our good. In Romans 8, Paul says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to 
his purpose. That means that even the bad stuff we go through is for our benefit. That no matter what we go through, we'll be able to look back on it one day and say, I'm thankful that happened. And now it may be only on the other side of eternity that we get that perspective. But it will be the truth. And so I can trust God with anything. I can trust Him through the health issues I've been having. Wake up every day with a migraine, it's there all day. It's debilitating. And it's something I've really had to wrestle with. But you know what? When God looks at me, He doesn't see my migraine as my most pressing problem. That's not the top of the list for him. The top of the list for him is my flesh and my sin that's competing for his affection that wants, me, that wants to pull me from him. That's top of the list for him. So if we have to go through this to fix that, worth it. It makes no sense for him to heal my body and leave my soul sick. It doesn't do any good. And in 1 Peter, he writes something that I think speaks well to this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. He says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now normally you just see this part of that sentence, but it's one sentence. It starts with the humble yourself under his hand, then casting your anxieties on him. So why does he say that? Why does he add, what's the humble yourself thing there for? Well, he's saying accept what God's giving you. Trust him. Why is it why does he say humble? Because sometimes I feel like I know better. Like, yeah, I, I know that you've figured this out, you've got this plan here, but I'm just saying, it could use some touches. I've got some notes, <laughs> all right? <laughs> like, your plan's pretty great, but, okay, we could tweak it. We can improve this, I, you know? I want to, yeah, let's, let's, bump the, let's bump this up a little bit. It's, you know, it's kind of like bumping, you know, touching up a screenplay or something. Like, okay. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense what's happening here. I feel like my character wouldn't do that. And so, you know, it's so easy to think that we've got a better idea. And what Peter's saying is now trust him and rest. And then he says to cast all of our anxieties on him because he cares for us. He cares for us. He wants the absolute best for us. And he's wise and knows what that means, what that will entail. So our anxiety that Jesus is telling us to get rid of, to not do it, how, well, how do we do that? It's just cast it on him. It's this word that means throw, just like chuck it, get it out of there. They kind of just like, gone, don't want it. It's like you're playing hot potato, but God's really bad at it because he never throws it back. He's just you're like, ah, here it goes, and got it. It's like, well, that's not the, you know. Just chuck it. As soon as it comes on, just throw it. Get rid of it. Someone once wrote, the way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. When anxiety comes on, pray it away. And so don't be anxious, church. That's the message. Trust the good Father. Trust Him with what we eat. Trust Him with what we wear, and trust Him with our souls. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You that we can trust You in all things that you are in control, that nothing catches you by surprise. There's nothing that we can go through that you didn't see coming. Lord, help us to 
lean on and rely on you and your strength and your wisdom. Lord, give us wisdom to see the ways that you're at work in our lives. Give us eyes to see what you're doing in us and through us, even through our pain. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.